how appropriate as we sing King of Kings, as we enter into the second week of uh, our summer series called King of Kings, Jesus According to Matthew. Last week I began this series and um, wanting to help you understand who Matthew was and because who he was and what his objectives were are very important to our understanding and the absorption of what he has to say about Jesus in the book of Matthew. If you remember, I said that Matthew was Jewish. So he was a Jew and he was writing to a Jewish audience. And his overarching idea or, or, or objective is to describe and take care of Jesus' king credibility problem. His king credibility problem. Because Matthew's going to write about Jesus as king of kings, and he's going to write about the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of God. But Jesus, um, he came from a working class family. He, he didn't come from a royal bloodline, at least on the surface. So Matthew 1 is establishing that Jesus came from the line of David. Matthew 2, he deals with kind of the second element of Jesus' king credibility problem. And that was the Messiah was supposed to come from Bethlehem. And yet, Jesus came from Nazareth. Right? And so, Nazareth was kind of considered the place you didn't want to live. In fact, there's a quote in the New Testament that says, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? So, it's kind of like the wrong city, the wrong side of the city. And if this is the Messiah, why is he from Nazareth? So Matthew 2 walks us through that Jesus, no, and in fact, was born in Bethlehem, and he takes us through how he lands in Nazareth. He deals with those two big issues of what the Jewish audience would have seen as Jesus' king credibility problem. And then Matthew 3, this is where we lived last week. In Matthew 3, here comes the, the silence of God breaking in the midst of this new culture, this new kingdom. Um, when John the Baptist steps up and says, Behold the Lamb of God who came, who's come to take away the sins of the world, John the Baptist breaks 400 years of prophetic silence. So when the, Malik, when the prophet Malachi ends his prophecy, there is no more prophetic action until we get to John the Baptist's words, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But then another silence is broken. Because when Jesus is baptized, when he comes out out of the water, the Holy Spirit descends on him like a dove. A voice from heaven says, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. God breaks, himself breaks the silence. And that's Matthew chapter 3. He is the king. He was born to a kingly line. He was born in the right place. He's been announced as the King of Kings. Now, we're going to stay today in Matthew 5, but Matthew 4 is a significant chapter as well. And I'll do this all the way through this series. We can't tackle everything there is to Matthew, but I'll try to keep the red thread moving for you. Matthew chapter 4, when Jesus comes out of the, the, the baptism, out of the Jordan, says that the Holy Spirit leads him into the wilderness. Here's, here's how it's, it's written. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Now, the Holy Spirit isn't trying to set up Jesus to fall. What he's doing here is this is a very intimate time, maybe the most intimate time that we see the rest of the gospel of God the Son spending this kind of time with God the Father. 40 days, 40 nights, in isolation, not even distracted by what's for dinner. Now, it's difficult as you read through the Gospels to remember that Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. And I believe in these 40 days, really what's going on is a Messiah download. It is now, look, you've lived your life, you've known You've known and not known maybe what all is happening. And now God the Father is with the Son, walking him through what these next three and a half years look like, that he indeed is the Messiah. Why, why would I say that? It's because all the temptations begin with, if you are the Son of God, then this. Okay? All the temptations are dealing with the identity of Christ, where, where the enemy is trying to get him to cancel his Messiahship by proving to him that he's the Messiah. And yet, 
God's word spoken. He was God. And so in that time, he thwarts every temptation that Satan puts forward with the word of God, the truth of God. And that's Matthew chapter 4. When we get to Matthew chapter 5, here becomes what's known as the public ministry of Jesus. Here becomes this, this, this first big message that he has. It encompasses chapter 5 all the way through chapter 7. It's been labeled by editors as the Sermon on the Mount. And I believe that's probably the worst title ever. Because today would be Sermon on Lewisburg Pike. Don't you want to come hear that? Right there, there's no descriptive nature to that. It's just what the editors had put down. But here's Jesus' intent. Now that he has been baptized, he spent the time with the Father, now he's ready to launch this kingdom of God. And 5, 6, and 7 is his main discourse on this is what the kingdom of God looks like. Now, why is that important? Because if you read the Sermon of the Mount, 5 through 7, if you read it like, I've got to be like this, I've got to aspire to this, how am I going to get to that? It's going to be a constant source of I don't measure up. But Christ, now you, when you look at it, you can parse it out, and that's how, you can, that's how you can read it. But yet, what Jesus is demonstrating is this is what the kingdom of God looks like. And when you allow the kingdom of God to come inside and ruin your life, rule your life, this is what your life's going to look like. Now, listen. Um, in Matthew 7, 28, it says, When Jesus had finished saying these things, so the sermon's over. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he had taught as one who had authority and not their teachers of the law. Now, there's, there's two kinds of smart. There's book smart and there's street smart. Okay? Now, now I, I like them both, actually. Um, but you can tell when a book smart person is trying now to teach you how to do something. There's just, there's just, something, there's just something not quite there because they haven't wrestled it down themselves so that can, they can demonstrate. They can tell you what to do, but they can't show you what to do. You with me? So when Jesus is teaching, the, the, the teachers of the law was all about telling them about how to do something that they really they weren't doing. They had, they had defined righteousness as this, and they weren't measuring up. And so when they taught the law, I believe they kept teaching it in a way that kind of made a way for them to still achieve it, and actually what they were doing is always doing shortcuts. Now, street smart is someone that can get something done, but they can't tell you how to do it. They can get it done, but they're not going to be able to instruct you how to do it. And what Jesus, the authority that comes from Jesus here, is Jesus saying, I'm going to teach you about the kingdom of God, and I know what I'm talking about. Because I'm not just living the kingdom, God. I am the king. And I'm going to demonstrate to you how this kingdom works. In Matthew 13, he describes the kingdom of God in this manner. Uh, where did it go? That might not, be, it might not be where I'm supposed to be. That's a problem with doing this thing twice. You never remember. All right, so, so anyway, I'll describe the kingdom in, in a second. I told you I'm, I'm not calling this sermon on Lewisburg Pike. So, so what am I calling it? Well, this is what I believe he teaches us in, um, in the Sermon on the Mount. A kingdom convergence causes a kingdom clash, create a, creating a kingdom choice. That's why an editor wouldn't choose that. They'd, they'd tear that up. But, but I get to write my own, my own title. So it's a, a kingdom convergence causes a kingdom clash, and that is going to create a kingdom choice. Romans 12, 2, Paul gives us an indication of how this kingdom works and how his kingdom works. All right? So here's what Paul says. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing, perfect will. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. Conformity, then, is the world, this kingdom, trying to squeeze us into its mold. 
Now, isn't it interesting that Paul doesn't say, do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be conformed to the kingdom of God. He doesn't say that, does he? What's the word? Transformed. So conformed is, is someone squeezing us into a pattern, a mold, a way of thinking. But what happens with the kingdom of God is it starts inside and it transforms us. So it's not about reading this as, how can I do this? It's reading this of, of what will happen when we allow the kingdom of God to get inside of us and to grow. There's a difference there. One's filled with hope. One's with filled with a lot of angst. Here's where I was going with Matthew 13. Matthew 13, Jesus describes the kingdom of God like this. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and planted in his field. Though it's the smallest of all seeds, yet when it grows, it is the largest of garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds come and perch in its branches. This is Jesus' description of the kingdom that he's teaching us about back here in Matthew 5. That the kingdom, as a seed, we would say this is something we take in. And the seed we take in, and the kingdom of God, once it's inside, if it's watered and yielded to, the kingdom grows. Isn't it interesting that in your yard or your garden that you don't have to encourage any weeds to grow? They just, they happen. But the things that you want to grow, you've got to pay attention to. It's there. The seed was there. The plant was there. And the more you pay attention to that plant, the more it grows. And that's what he's saying about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is not about trying to conform to a pattern. The kingdom of God is receiving the word, receiving Christ inside of us and allowing that to grow and so that growth, that growth transforms us and it transforms the whole garden. Which means if you notice in his little description of the kingdom, it impacts everything, even the birds. The birds now have a place to rest because of the seed that has grown. And so I'm telling you, if you allow this message to take heart, it will transform what you even think of Christianity? I've said this so many times in here, that Christianity is not a behavioral modification pattern or system. It is not something we conform to. It's something we surrender to. We surrender to the kingdom. And when we surrender to the kingdom, that transformation, look, it's a kingdom convergence. We live here. But with Christ... We are living his kingdom. That's, there's a convergence. Those kingdoms have come together, and that convergence will always create a clash. You can expect it. What do we do with it is the question. So Jesus begins Matthew 5 with what is called the Beatitudes. A Beatitude, the word literally means extreme blessedness. Now, if you read the list of these Beatitudes, blessed are the, and there's eight, you either don't want to be those because they're so contrary to what this kingdom says be like, or you don't think you could ever get there anyway. Okay? And so you can breeze over it and say it's good poetry because you can't obtain it. And yet Jesus is saying, listen, read it this way. Jesus is saying that if you allow the kingdom to grow inside of you, this is going to be the fruit of that. These are the people you're going to become. There is a reward to becoming like that. And it is directly opposite of how this kingdom works. See, it's, it's tough to recognize sometimes how his kingdom works because we're so immersed in this kingdom. And that's why it's important that we have the word of God and reading the word of God from the right perspective. So here, here how he begins. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside and he sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hung that hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, 
for they will be called children of God. And he ends with, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil things against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now you read over those and you go, poor in spirit. I'm not sure what that means, but it has the word poor in it. So not going to choose that one, right? Mourn. I'm doing my best not to mourn. I I don't want to be in any kind of mourning state. Why would I want to mourn, right? And so you can go through these and you go, I don't even know if I want to be these things. And yet what Jesus is saying is the kingdom of God looks like this. And and you, when you're in the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God growing in you, this is what you look like. And these are extremely blessed places to be that come with great rewards. So I I read the Beatitudes not just as poetry anymore. And I don't read it as, ah, oh, how do I get there? I read it that if I let the kingdom of God grow in me, this should be a picture. And it, literally, I can then even measure, if you will, how am I growing in the kingdom? How is the kingdom growing inside of me? Am I looking more and more like this? Let's just go over them for a second. Poor in spirit. Poor in spirit describes spiritual dependency. That I am, I am dependent on my father. I'm dependent on the king. Not self-dependent. This kingdom wants us to be independent. Completely self-sustaining. That I've got this. We even say it. I've got this. And yet when the kingdom of God grows inside of us, we have more of a recognition, I don't got this. But I'm dependent on the one who does. And that shift of mentality changes how we go at life. It changes how we deal with life coming at us. When we're poor in spirit. When we are self, uh, not self-independent, but self-dependent on the king. He goes on. He says, for those who mourn. What in the world? Why would those, why would we want that? He's, He's describing here someone who has joy and hope in the kingdom but has a recognition of of the people around them, and and there is a mourning that they don't have what I have. It's when Jesus enters into Jerusalem on the day that, um, on on the uh, uh, Palm Sunday. Only two times in Scripture, Jesus is recorded of crying. Only two. One is when Lazarus dies, and he's with Mary and Martha. Now, what's he crying about then? He knows in a a little bit he's going to call Lazarus out. He's calling because he, he, he... He is empathetic to the loss that Mary and Martha feel, even though he knows something's going to change. He's moved by our emotions. What about crying in Jerusalem? He cries in Jerusalem because they missed him. He had come, and they missed him, and he cries. Jesus wept, shortest verse of Scripture in all of the Bible. And and I I said this, I I might have said this at Easter, but Scripture's written without any kind of um, punctuation, Okay? Scribes went in and added punctuation and and verses and chapters to make it easier to understand. So think about how significant that was, that some scribe somewhere starts going across these words and Jesus wept and went, wait a minute. I've only written that one other time. this, This needs to be set off. There needs to be a period after this and a period after this because people need to see his heart for this kingdom. Blessed are those who mourn, that can live in the joy of this new kingdom, but not resting because there is a tug for those who haven't experienced this kingdom. When the kingdom of God grows inside of you more and more, there becomes more of a mourning for those who haven't received the king. Blessed are the meek. Any takers? Nothing about this culture wants us to be meek, brash, take control. I've been known to step into certain circumstances with a take control mindset. I remember walking out of a retail store after a display of that at one time. And my daughter, who at the time was nine, said, Dad, remember, you are a pastor in this town. So so meek isn't always my go-to. 
Because we define meek as weak. Meek is defined as gentle. Kind. Isn't it interesting that Jesus says that um, it's his kindness that leads to repentance? It's not his brashness. Not his boldness. He don't break through a door. It's his kindness that leads to repentance. Meek doesn't say I'm going to back down. It just says when I move forward, it's going to be in kindness and gentleness, but I'm not going anywhere. It's a completely different thing, and it's what happens when the kingdom of God grows up inside of us. Those who hunger and thirst for righteousness are those that have such a desire to see rightness and justice that, that they long for. It is, a, it, is a, it is a long and desire. It's not something that I can pass off or turn another eye to. There is a hunger and thirst for the rightness, the righteousness, the justice of God to prevail in every circumstance. It's not a passing thought. There becomes this, this longing for, this push for, I'm hungry and thirsty to see this righteousness and justice. The merciful. Blessed are the merciful. We don't, we don't understand mercy in this kingdom. We define mercy in this kingdom as, um, well, don't worry about it. Forget about it. No, come on, everybody's welcome. It, it, it is a, we, we, we define mercy as the elimination of all standard. It's not how God defines mercy. The way God defines mercy is, you're wrong. You're sinful. You're my enemy. I died for you anyway. Mercy is not a gloss over. It is a full embodiment of wrong. And it's welcomed and embraced and forgiven. So as the kingdom of God grows inside of you, your mercy towards others grows. Your heart for others grows. You are less offended, less put off, easy to forgive. And Jesus says the reward of that is you will receive mercy. Pure in heart. Any takers? Any pure hearters walked in the door today? I'm 0 for 2 services. No pure of heart. What does it mean by pure of heart? It doesn't mean perfect. It means an undivided loyalty. That I have an undivided loyalty. It isn't that I don't stray. It isn't that I make bad choices. It's but I... I'm setting my heart. And as the kingdom of God grows inside of us, that undividedness gets more cemented. In Matthew 6, just one chapter later in the Sermon on the Mount, is when he tells us you can't serve God and mammon. Now, why does he say that? He says that because there are other things that want to exert God control in our lives. The reason why Christianity and the kingdom of God gets blasted the way it is is because we live in a culture that would accept Jesus and because we live in a pluralistic culture. We're religiously pluralistic, just like the first century. Adding another God, no big deal. They had thousands of gods. You studied some of them in school and Greek mythology. Having another God, no problem. Having someone that said they were God and nobody else was God, there's your problem. You want to deal with a this kingdom and a his kingdom thing that we're walking in? Is that one right there. People will want to hear you all day long if it's a Jesus and. If it's just Jesus adding a new twist to this or another thing over here, but when it is Jesus as the only King of kings and Lord of lords, there's your roadblock. But it says here, blessed are the pure in heart, that, that as the kingdom of God grows inside of me, I have this undivided loyalty. I'll speed up here. Peacemakers. Peacemaker. I'm a pretty good peacemaker. No, let me take that back. I'm a pretty good peacekeeper. Now, you, you can come to me with DEFCON 5, and I can get you off the ledge, back in another corner, and we'll get through this. 
But peacekeeping ends up just being a compromise. We just kind of move some things around and we compromise. We don't really solve anything. Peacekeepers don't really solve anything. They actually, sometimes all they've done is delay something. It's not talking about peacekeeping. It's not a peacemaker. A peacemaker is someone willing to do the hard work of reconciliation. That they'll step into something that's very difficult and they will stay put to bring peace. Jesus wasn't a peacekeeper. He didn't come to negotiate between the sin of mankind and the righteousness of his Father. He was a peacemaker. He stepped into it and he took away our sin. And then persecuted. We all want that one, don't we? We all long for the persecution. But it's when the kingdom of God, he's saying here, when the kingdom of God grows inside of you, go ahead and expect it. Go ahead and expect it. Because when the kingdom of God grows in you, you're going to look more and more like Christ, which means you're going to respond more and more like Christ. And when you respond more and more like Christ, and you are more and more like Christ, then there comes the persecution. The quieter we are, the more we're off to ourselves, we'll get away with maybe another five years to ten years, maybe. But his kingdom is to be here in the middle of this kingdom, and they converge, it converges through us. Our salvation converges the kingdoms. So that kingdom convergence causes a clash, and it demands a choice demands a choice. Um, how do you choose the kingdom of God? We live in a culture that wants to treat truth like opinion and opinion like truth. So the, the way in which the kingdom of God grows, starts growing in us is the recognition that Christ is the truth and we surrender our lives to him. The surrender of our lives is the repentance. It's the first part of John the Baptist and Jesus' message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is near. A repentance is a turning away. It is making a conscious choice of surrender and moving now into the kingdom of God. Of God. That's how the kingdom of God starts. That's how the seed gets planted. It gets planted with the surrender. I want your kingdom, even when I don't even understand all of this kingdom yet. What I understand is your mercy and your grace. I understand where I am and I want to be where you are. That is surrender. Then it moves to identification. How does this kingdom begin to grow now that it's planted? identification. Here's what I mean. Jesus steps into the water of baptism to identify with us in our sin. Then he asks us to step into a water of baptism to identify with his righteousness. Baptism, water baptism, is the next move in identification. Now let me let me break this down a little bit. If you came from a Roman Catholic tradition, and I know we have plenty every service, baptism was something that you did as a child or you did for your children, and it was a, it was a christening. It was a sprinkling of water by the priests. That wasn't a baptism of salvation. What's happening there is in the Catholic tradition, salvation comes through the church. And when you belong to the church, the Catholic church, there's salvation. So the child as an infant is being baptized into the church to receive salvation. Okay? But as a Protestant faith, this is one of the main differences, and Catholicism is strong in a lot of areas. But here in this instance, as a Protestant, we'd say that baptism is a, a response to salvation and identification, and a baby can't make that now, if you didn't come from a Roman Catholic tradition, maybe you've come, since we're in Southern Baptist world, you might have come from a Southern Baptist perspective. And this, my Southern Baptist friends would say that baptism, without baptism, there isn't salvation. Okay? Well, I don't believe Scripture supports that. So then, if it's not salvation, then what's the point of a water baptism. 
here's the point. Anytime Jesus ever asks us to do something, it would be a good idea to recognize its significance, even though I might not understand how all that gets applied. That there's something more to being dunked and come back up that I can grasp. Let me tell you how significant it is in other parts of the world. In other parts of the world, persecution will begin after baptism. Suki, you come from one part of that world like that. That until I'm baptized, I'm saved because baptism is this public declaration of my undivided loyalty. And in many cultures, it severs you from their family. And in some cultures, it sets you up then that you are open to open persecution. Now, here's what's fascinating. I read, I read a report recently that the Iranian church is probably growing faster than any other church in the world. Let me tell you something. The church has always thrived under persecution. It has, it has uh, kind of waffled historically when there was peace. Baptism is significant. The third way we work ourselves deeper or work the kingdom seed deeper inside of us is through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So in Matthew 3, I told you that John said, hey, there's someone coming after me that I will baptize you in water, but there's someone coming after me that will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. There's someone coming after me that will baptize you with power and purification. Now today, historically, in the Jewish calendar, today is the day of Pentecost. Pentecost was 50 days after the Passover, and it was one of the three feasts that every Jewish male was required to come to Jerusalem to celebrate. It was a celebration of a first harvest. But before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told his disciples that they were to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit came. In fact, he says, the Holy Spirit will come on you, and you will become my witnesses. Become. Become is not just, it's not, it doesn't start with a do. It's a B. It's a transformation. When the Holy Spirit comes, you will, be, you will be transformed. You will become my witnesses. He spent the night that he would, was betrayed, he spent, at least the way my vernacular would say, he spent John chapter 15, John chapter 16, and John chapter 17 telling the disciples about this Holy Spirit. Saying, look, I got to go. I, I'm not going to be here much longer. But I'm going to send my spirit. I'm going to send the comforter. I'm going to send someone just like me. And look, in fact, you're going to do greater things after I go than when I've been here. And so when, when he, before he ascends and he says, hey, go wait in Jerusalem for this Holy Spirit I told you about. There weren't any questions. There wasn't any decisions to be made. Hey, you told us about this presence and we'll do this. He didn't have to tell him what it was going to look like just who they would become. And just like Matthew was the furthest away from God as the, the, the disciples and the disciples, I told you that last week, Peter in Acts chapter 2 turns into a completely different person. I mean, Peter was brash. Peter, Peter was a brash fisherman. And every circumstance Peter inserted himself in was in a brash fashion. I'm going to take control. I'm going to, no one's going to die. If anybody dies here today, Jesus, I'm going to die with you. I mean, he was brash. And yet when it all falls apart, or when he th all thinks it all falls apart, he's an empty suit. And yet when the Holy Spirit comes, it transforms Peter not from brash, it trans transforms Peter to bold. Now Peter stands up to the very people that he would, run, would have run away from and announces the man that you crucified, he was the Christ. That's a significant transformation in less than two months. Because he had received the power of the Holy Spirit for the kingdom of God to grow inside of us, for us to make kingdom choices. We are not left in our own power. We, we, we don't come to Christ and then he gives us a little pat on the backside and said, now go after it, champ. 
all of us would fail. He says, no, I, 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 will, I will put my spirit in you, Ezekiel prophesies. And I will take this heart of stone that can't receive anything, and I'll give you this heart of flesh that can receive me. And my breath will bring back all the dryness and put all the muscles back together, and you will be strong again. Joel tells us that no one is exempt from that, that he'll pour out his spirit in all flesh, young, old, male, female, because this is a way we move in the kingdom, is the receptivity we have to being baptized in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's necessary for us to receive Christ. The Holy Spirit's the one who convicts us of sin. He's the one who points out the difference between this kingdom and his kingdom. But after that conviction and after our surrender, there's more to it. We find in the book of Acts, there is this baptism. And then the way we can, then we've, then we can live in the next part. And the next part is this idea of that we, we yield to the kingdom. We yield to the kingdom. In the message I did on money, winning at money, I told you the hardest person to say no to was ourselves. And, and I don't think I wrote that down anywhere. I think it came out in the moment. And what I've now found in the last three weeks is I've had a hard time telling myself no to some stuff. I, I mean, I can't tell you how many times, you know, a silly one, I'm, I'm trying to get in better condition, better shape, but I love ice cream. And it's not, there's anything wrong with ice cream, but at nine o'clock at night's not the best time to dive into the half gallon. You know what I'm saying? And so I, I have, I've won and, and, and lost over Right? And so in all our life, we live in this kingdom. Listen, in Matthew 6, part of the message on, on the kingdom he's teaching, he says that we are to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. What is he saying? He's saying you need to relentlessly pursue the kingdom. Why? Because this kingdom we're living in relentless, relentlessly pursues us. We are relentlessly pursued by this kingdom. Its values, its culture, its choices. We are relentlessly pursued. How do you overcome that? You relentlessly pursue the kingdom. You relentlessly pursue the kingdom by continuing to yield to the truth of the gospel. And in each circumstance, understand I am self-dependent on Christ, not independent. Now, Holy Spirit, I, these two choices in front of me and I want to walk your kingdom. And every time we yield, every time you yield to the kingdom of God, you gain strength in the kingdom. Last thing. Jesus follows immediately with the Beatitudes with some, um, well, the impact, I guess you could say. It says that we're salt and light in the next few verses. It talks to us being salt and light. So, you know, soldiers were paid in the first century. Some of the soldiers were paid in salt. Have you ever used the expression or heard the expression said, they're not worth their salt? That's where it comes from. That salt was actually a form of payment. Salt's valuable then. And then we have the natural uses for salt. We have flavor. We have preserving nature, salt. There's even a healing nature to a salt, right? If you go in the ocean with a cut on your leg, you come out, you know, with a bionic leg. You know, it's an amazing transformation that takes place with salt. And then light. We know that light is healing. Sunlight gives us vitamin D. Light, it lights our path. Isn't it interesting how sad you can be overnight, but then how refreshed you can be in the morning? And so what he's saying is the impact of when we have, when we have the kingdom converge, when we have the kingdom of God inside of us, it converges with, it converges with this kingdom. And there is a clash. But when we continue to choose the kingdom of God, we become, we have impact by our presence. Our presence brings value, brings flavor, brings healing, brings direction into any place we insert ourselves. Did you think you had that kind of power? You do have that kind of power. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the one inside of us that grows and nurtures this seed of the kingdom. 
And the result is, is salt and light. That's, that's the impact when I continue to choose the kingdom. When I relentlessly pursue the kingdom, I change people and circumstances I insert myself in. From a prayer side, it is Matthew 6 again where Jesus teaches the disciples how to pray as a part of this Sermon on the Mount. He says, these people over here, they pray out of self-importance to be heard. This is how you pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So I, I am an, I'm an impact in my presence and impact in my prayer because the Father has taught me as his son to pray for his kingdom to manifest itself in this kingdom. So when I pray into circumstances and situations, when I pray into lives of people, I am praying the kingdom come with the power of the words of my Father and brother Christ. Presence, my prayer. Another reason the impact is of the kingdom of God is just its pure value. So just like he describes the kingdom of God like this seed that's planted and it, and it grows into this tree in the garden, he also describes the kingdom of God in this way later on in the book of Matthew. He said, the kingdom of God is like a man who came across a treasure in a field. And when he found it, he left, sold all that he had, and went back to buy that field. What's that saying? He came across something so infinitely of infinite value that he liquidated every asset that he owned in order to get enough of the resource necessary to buy this field from the people that didn't know that there was a treasure in it. He buys the field in this limitless treasure is now his. There's the value of the kingdom. That the kingdom of God is worth more than anything you have ever wanted in your life. And it is of so much value that whatever you had ever wanted ahead of time, when you leave that to the side and go after his kingdom, what you receive is of, of infinite value. You know, I've been around a while, talked to a lot of people, and there's always comes with someone, there always comes this question of, well, you know, what, what is coming to Christ going to cost me? Am I going to have to stop doing this and stop doing that and doing this and doing that, and there comes this measuring time of, well, is the, kingdom of, is the kingdom of God really, really worth it? And I never once try to talk anybody out of any of that. It's better answers by some pretty good questions. Is your life what you thought it would be? And no doubt, it's not. Maybe you're old enough to have already achieved a few things that you thought would be your ticket. And it turned out that they weren't. The kingdom of God is so valuable. The things that you consider the most valuable, they don't scratch the surface to the kingdom of God. It'll transform how you read the book of Matthew. If you see this as what God presents as his kingdom and what's possible when we allow that seed to grow in us, these aren't things that we achieve on our own. These are things we surrender to and yield to and they grow inside of us in power. See, I can do that. I can allow a seed to grow. I can water a seed. I can make daily choices, but I can't grow meekness and gentleness and I can't grow 
orange. I can't grow that stuff inside of me. I don't have it in me to do it. But I can yield to it and watch it grow. So what do we do with the kingdom of God here in this moment? I would present this to you. That if you've, if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, which is this acknowledgement that he is who he said he was. He is the king of kings. He died on a cross so that our sins would be forgiven. And the response to that is repentance. It's saying, I, I, I want to surrender my life to you. Take away my sin. And repentance literally means it's a change of mind and a change of direction. That's how the kingdom of God begins. It doesn't begin any other way. Trying to be nicer and add Jesus to a few things and a few prayers over a meal and a church once in a while, it, that, that will be more, listen, that is more frustrating than surrendering and allowing the kingdom to grow. You, 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 you keep trying to put wallpaper over broken sheetrock. Rip the broken stuff out. Get the mold out. Get it out and let him rebuild something that you couldn't have even dreamed to build in the first place. He has done all of the heavy lifting. He leaves it for us to receive. And once we receive, the transformation happens. The conforming starts to be less and less, and the transforming gets to be more and more. Maybe you've done that. Let's talk about water baptism. We, we baptize children at Gateway. I baptized my daughter when she was five. She had an understanding of who Jesus was and she wanted to follow Jesus. And, and, and that is an encouraging part of a child's faith then for baptism if they understand but how much can a five and seven and nine and ten year old understand? Maybe you were maybe you were baptized when you were young, but there's been a whole lot of life lived between that moment and now. So, see, baptism to me again, it's not salvation. So it's not why well, I've been baptized, so I'm saved. It's is there is there a need for a public identification with Jesus now as an adult? Or maybe you've never been baptized. It was just some ritual you thought churches did and it was, wasn't for you. It just seemed to be intimidating. I want to encourage you that when Jesus was baptized, we follow him in that baptism. Holy Spirit baptism. I'm convinced if people weren't concerned about what it would look like, more people would be open to being baptized in the Spirit. Because it's an openness and invitation for the power of God to reside in you at a different level than maybe ever before in your life. And it's that power that gives us the kind of power necessary to live and walk out this His kingdom in this kingdom. And then lastly, a yielding. We always don't get it this right. But every time we get it right, we grow stronger. So here's what I want to present to you as I pray. I'm going to ask you to stand. If, if these things apply to you, we're just going to pray where you are in your seat standing. But Father, in this moment, this is a holy moment before you. Lord, your word is spoken to us plainly about your kingdom. And Lord, now your spirit is calling us to respond. And if you're in the room and you've never surrendered your life to Christ, you've dabbled around the edges, you've added him to a few things, but you're racking your brain and you cannot think 
of any time that you have surrendered to him, I just want you, I want you to stand in this moment. In this moment, it's I surrender. I surrender to Christ. As we push deeper into the kingdom, Pastor, I, I want to be baptized. I want to be water baptized. Whether it's the first time or you know there's been a too, too big of a gap of distance and life lived. And you want to publicly identify with him again. I'm not rolling the baptistry out and pulling you up here. But if that's you, I want you to stand. I, I'm, I'm ready when the next time comes, I want to be baptized. Amen. It's our identification with the Father. We push in a little deeper. Pastor, I need the power of the Holy Spirit in my life. I need it and want it at a greater measure than I've ever had before. I want you to stand up. I want the Holy Spirit's power and presence in my life, and I want it stronger and greater than ever before. God bless you. Holy Spirit, in this moment, Lord, we've done exactly what the disciples did on the day of Pentecost. We, we went into that room under your direction, under your promise. And so, Lord, as these men and women have stood, Lord, I pray that you would baptize them in power and in fire as John said that Jesus would. Holy Spirit, transform in the name of Jesus. Lastly, you say, Pastor, I, I understand this idea of the conflict of kingdoms, and, and I want to stand today because I, I, want to, I want to be empowered to make more His kingdom choices than this kingdom choices. And if I'm honest, Pastor, lately this kingdom has won more than His kingdom. I just want you to stand. This kingdom has won more than his kingdom. But I want that to be done. And Father, for those hearts, Lord, it's not about us measuring up to your standard. It's about you raising us up to your standard. Lord, highlight the choices in neon and this week, and as they choose your kingdom, Lord, let them sense a strength, a spiritual strength, Lord, that's noticeable. That's noticeable. That would continue to push them forward. Lord, making choices for your kingdom. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. If everyone would stand for the benediction. A kingdom convergence will always cause a kingdom clash, but it creates opportunities for a kingdom choice. And when we choose his kingdom, the presence that we bring into any situation, with salt and light and prayer, the choices of walking in his kingdom are more valuable than you could ever think or imagine. And he's gifted that to us through his son. If you're a guest today, it's great having you part of our worship service. It's a pleasure to be able to worship the Lord with you. Um, we'd love to meet you right after this service under the sea. There'll be someone there. We'd love to begin learning your name. Um, we consider it an honor that you've chosen to be with us here today. Now for the benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May make his face shine on you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace. And you're rising up, you're laying down, you're going out and coming in, both now and forevermore. God bless you.